Today, Russell's gonna teach you all that he knows about business. Russell Brunson is the founder of ClickFunnels, a sales and marketing company worth over $1 billion. His books have sold hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide and are widely regarded as Bibles for online marketing. Russell, what are we gonna to learn today? So point number one is figuring out who is your dream customer. Number two is where are they hanging out online? Step number three, what is the hook we're gonna to use to grab them and pull them into our funnels? Step number four, I can talk about the landing page. Number five, after you got them, then we gotta create a presentation to convert them to where we're trying to sell. Number six is about getting them to say the very first yes. And then number seven, how do we then get them to say the second yes? Right, let's get into point number one then. Who is your dream customer? This is the step that I missed when I first got started. When I first got started, I did what a lot of entrepreneurs do, where like, you have an idea for a product, so you create the product, and then you put it out there, and one of two things happens, either nobody buys it because you weren't thinking about the customer, or people buy it, but then they're the wrong customers. That's what happened to me. I created my first offer, I put it out there, people started buying it, and because I never asked myself who I wanted to actually serve, I was just creating an idea that came to my head, I started selling it, these people that were buying my products were the wrong people. And um, I created a really good offer, so we sold a lot of people. And I remember the business started growing, and the more it grew, the more like I dreaded it because I didn't love the customers. And I remember one day waking up, I was laying in bed, and I was like, I wish that I had a boss so they would fire me because I don't want to see my customers. I don't want to go in there, I don't want to talk to them. Yeah. And it was so painful that I was sabotaging my own business. Can I say love love your customer? Is this, is this actually? 100%. I, I've never heard that before, and actually, I actually love my customers, mm -hmm. people, my, my community, but I never really framed it that way. I thought I just assumed that I loved them because I had the product that they wanted and it could help them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I have had businesses where I haven't loved my customers. Yeah. So that's made me rung a bell with me that has. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it made me sit back and as I as I had that business, I was miserable. I was like, okay, like what if I shut the whole thing down? I was scared because I'm like, I'm gonna lose my business. But I was like, I'm not happy. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna start from the ground up. Like, who do I actually want? Like, who would I go and I would I would work for free because I I want to hang out with these people. They're like, I would I would enjoy serving them. Like everything I was creating would be like helping them. Like, who was that person? And I spent a lot of time really identifying like who would my dream customer be. And I started, um, in fact, the exercise I did I went to Google Images and I typed in like I typed in person I was, the guy's name would be Michael and he'd be an athlete and he would be. I started typing in all these like phrases of what my dream customer would be. And I clicked on it and Google Images pulled up all these faces. And I scrolled through the faces so I found one and I was like that that's my Michael. So I took his face, printed it out, I put it on a frame on my wall. I was like that's my that's my first dream customer. And then I did the same thing for the female side. I wrote Julie and I wrote in all the things about her. And Google Images, I found a picture. I took her, printed it out, put it on the wall. I was like, hey, this is Mike and Julie. These are my dream customers. Now, what would I create that they would be excited about? That's such a brilliant way. And I started way. shifting how I looked at things. Do you know what I love about this? Is idea generation is one of the tough things for people. So mm -hmm. people come up, they try to come up with a product that would fill a market gap. Yeah. But they're not thinking about the people they'd like to work with, yeah. basically, right? Yeah. Who are the people you enjoy every day? It would be a joy to help them. Yeah. And, and, and that reverse engineering can give you the idea. Yeah, well, 100%, because then you're not trying to be creative. Like, I'm not a very creative person, but I know who my customers are, and I'm obsessed with them, and I know yeah. where they're at, and I talk to them, and so I look, and they, they tell you all the ideas. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I wish we could do this. Oh, we're struggling because of this. Like, people, I have people all the time come to me, like, where'd you get the idea for ClickFunnels? I was like, because my, like, all of my customers were entrepreneurs who were trying to, trying to sell stuff online, and when they were all, like, they were talking about it, and they were trying to do upsells, and all these things, like, all the stuff that, that we end up creating, like I was just listening to them. I was like, that's what they want. We should just make that. And so oh, gee, that's, that's where the software came. All the books came, like everything's come off of the back of like figuring out my dream customers and then just listening to it. Everybody that knows you would have thought that you came up with the idea and then you found customers for it. <laughs> it's actually brilliant. Love your customer. What else if you're looking for your dream customer? Because I, again, for me, it's like personality trait. No, mm -hmm. they they got to be open to criticism, for example. Mm -hmm. The people listening got to realize maybe they don't know everything and they can, they've got something to learn. That, that kind of teachability kind of thing. What, what, how do you, do you look at it that way? Yeah, I think it's, it's partially thinking about that. It's those kind of things, right? But then the, the biggest thing I've noticed, I didn't realize this when I first kind of started doing this, but I've noticed working with clients for a long time is they get stuck, okay, well, I, don't know who my, I don't even know who my dream customer is. And what the answer is, if you think about it, your dream customer is typically you five years ago. Mm. Like you, whatever you're selling, mm. most businesses are selling a result, right? And so if you have the result, it's like the thing you're selling is to you before you figure that result, right? And so I always think, go back to go back to five years ago, like who were you? So for me, when I got started, I got started young in this business. I was um, in middle school and I was collecting junk mail. I would order, I would order things online, um, like send away for free money making kits and stuff like that. And so I would get junk mail sent to my my parents' house every day, right? And I come home from school and there'd be a stack of mail like this big 
And um, back then, my 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 name my name is Russell, but my parents called me Rusty. So I always think like, this is Rusty. Like, what would Rusty want? So I'd come from school. I'd grab my mail. I'd sit on my bed and I'd open up each letter. And I'd read the sales letter. And some of them I was like, ah, that's not fun. And some I'd read. I was like. Mom, mom, I need your credit card, mom. And I'd be begging my parents. And so for me, it's like when I'm thinking about my dream customer, who was I five years ago? I think about 12 year old Rusty sitting in a bed reading something like, what would he got so excited he would beg his mom for the credit card? Like, right. if I can speak to that guy, like that's how I'm gonna create products and offers and funnels and messages that, that are gonna convert because that would have converted me, right? And that's what I think most people miss is that you're actually, your dream customer is you five years ago and you had to get back to that mindset because that's how you're gonna answer all the rest of the questions. You Plus, if it's you five years ago, there's a high chance you know all the answers to five years ago you, yeah. right? Like I'm actually helping the 20 year old me uh -huh. who's stuck in business, can't quite figure out how to grow the business, can't quite figure out how to build a brand, yeah. right? So I, I totally relate to that. And I know now because I've gone through it. So if you go back five years, you've gained so much experience. Yeah. If you can give it to someone, brilliant. What yeah. else? Those are the core things on the first step is just really, uh, really understand that person. Again, for most of I would do the exercise where you type in the name, Google image, just print that out. Like Chat I would, GPT now. Yeah, that would be easier. Even, even quicker, yeah. <laughs> you know, all the AI personality a person for you. You, you like to fall in love by the time you've typed it all in, yeah. <laughs> but I like that, the dream customer. And then um, I guess we're gonna get into how to get the customer and yep. stuff like that. But um, so just, just for your personal background on when you were doing it. So what was what was special about Michael? What was it that you said that, was Michael an entrepreneur? Was that yeah. part of it? Yeah, because I think the people that I attracted initially that weren't happy was like, it was like people want to make money on the internet. That's who yeah. started coming to me. And those people were not the people I wanted. I'm an athlete, so I like working with athletes because they athletes have gone through something, right? They've, they've had to persevere, they lose, they win. They're not just people who are like, scared of trying, right? Mm -hmm. That was number one. Number two is like um, the next quality I wanted in my dream customer was somebody who wasn't in it for the money, but they, like, they, they had changed someone's life. Maybe they were a coach. They changed someone's life and they mm -hmm. felt that feeling, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And they like, that was so cool. I want, I want more of that. I want to have more impact. And so I was looking for someone like that who like, they're not money motivated, but they're very much impact motivated. Mm -hmm. And then. And, um, and I kept going through things like that. And what's fascinating is the very first time I ever shared that, it was um, one of our first big events we did. We had about a thousand people in the room. And I actually put the pictures of Mike and Julie on the wall. And I, I, told, I told the criteria of, of the people. And I looked out, I said, how many of you guys does this, is this you? And I asked about Michael and almost all the men's hands raised like, that's literally me. And then I asked the same thing to women and all of them like raised hand like, I'm literally Julie. I was mm -hmm. like, isn't that crazy? Like, after I knew who it was, like mm -hmm. you were the ones who were attracted. We had a thousand people in the room and you're all, like you fit that profile perfectly. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of a, a really cool moment to see that, whereas when you design it from the very beginning, focusing on that as the, the lead into any business, um, then you start attracting your dream customers. And now it's like crazy, cause like I would do this for free. Like I, I could hang out with the coolest people in the world and they're attracted to the message, they're, they're impact driven. When we help them, we see what happens and it's just, it shifts, it shifts everything. I think doing it for free is really powerful. I would also do this for free. I, I, love, I love helping people. This demographic you're talking about, sounds like we've got a similar demographic. I think money is an interesting one because people being motivated by money is sometimes a good thing, but equally the most important thing is that personal drive to improve yourself, yeah. that type of thing. Anyway, I love this. So we're gonna move on to the next thing, which is where are they hanging out? All right, let's do that. So what's interesting about the internet, what makes it so powerful, right, is if you know who your dream customer is, my second question is where are they hanging out? Because the, the reason why the internet became so powerful, it became a social, a social place, right, where people get to hang out and they congregate together based on similar beliefs and values and things that they're excited by, right? Which is why it's so powerful because we can find these people. So a good example, whenever I share this with somebody, the first time I used to say, um, instead of hanging out, I say, where are they congregating? And mm -hmm. I say, why, like, when you hear the word congregation, what do you typically think of? Churches, groups yeah. of people together, yeah. Yeah, so it's easier to, for me to, to think about it that way. So churches, so all, everyone congregates together at churches based on mm -hmm. beliefs and values, right? So mm -hmm. like all of the Baptists are over here, all the Catholics are over here, and like there's all these, there's all these like congregations of, of people, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the Mormons are over here, Catholics are here, so they are, right? And so they're these like, almost like a pond. I always think about this like, this is a pond and there's a whole bunch of these fish, right? Mm -hmm. That are already in here of the dream customer. So if I was selling something to Mormons or to Catholics or to Baptists or whatever it is, right? Um, and I knew there's a whole bunch of people gathered together. I wouldn't go and like try to, how do I get traffic on the internet? People always ask me, how do you get traffic? Because I wrote a book called Traffic Seekers. How do you get traffic on the internet? I'm like, traffic's already on the internet. You have to go, you're not creating it. Mm -hmm. You just find like, where's it already at? And then you go and you, and you get in front of it, right? Mm. And no, obviously I'm not telling people to go, you know, don't go to the Baptist hang church. Hang out with the church, out. just handing out flyers. <laughs> yeah, here, but, but conceptually they, they're congregating. And then, yeah. so the first time I think I, I really got this, so I'm a wrestler and um, when I, was, I wrestled in, in, in college and I remember um, the student athletes 
typically weren't like the best students. And so for all the wrestlers, like we had mandatory study hall every night we had to do. And so we had a wrestling practice, we go to dinner and we come back to study hall. So I'm in study hall and it's a room kind of like this actually with a whole bunch of computers and all the wrestlers are in there working. And I was on the website back in the day, it's no longer there, but it's called themat.com. And this is where all the wrestling, all the wrestlers would hang out. Mm. And they're talking about wrestling and they were talking about who won today and you know who's, re who's wrestling this weekend. Like, and, and it was funny because I was sitting there on the message boards talking and hanging out and I looked around and I noticed every other wrestler on my team was all on the same site. We were all hanging out on the same site. We were doing our homework. And I started thinking, I was like, that's here in my university. This is true in like every university around the country. But it's also true in high school. It's also true around the world. Mm -hmm. Like every wrestler who loves wrestling, we're, like everyone's on this one website. Now, if I was going to sell wrestling stuff, I wouldn't go try to like, how do I get wrestling traffic. Like, there's a hundred thousand or a million people on this site talking about wrestling all day. I'm just going to go and buy a banner ad on the site or send an email to or like, like all the people are one spot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's, what's so cool about this. When you first off, when you know who your dream customer is, second question is where are they already congregating? They've already self-selected themselves. They're already putting themselves in different places. So they're reading certain email lists. They're watching certain YouTube channels. They're listening to certain podcasts. They're reading certain blogs, right? They're on different Facebook groups. Like they're all congregated. And so when it comes to like, how am I going to start getting these people to come to me? It has nothing to do with like, like mastering traffic or knowing keywords, all that kind of stuff that people geek out at that makes traffic super confusing. It's just, okay, who's my dream customer? Where are they congregating? How do I get in front of those people? Mm. And that's, that's literally the whole game. The flip of this is a lot of people when they start a business, they say they need to build this community themselves. Yeah. And they get frustrated when people don't come into their group or come into yeah. their platform. Um, I actually did this myself before I, I built a platform called Help Bank, which is our own pond now. Mm -hmm. But for three years, we were in other people's ponds. So we were on TikTok where people mm -hmm. are learning, believe it or not. We're yeah. on YouTube where people are learning. And eventually you in the ponds with these people. One day you can say to them, oh, we've got a new pond yeah. if you want. But it takes years. You yeah. don't necessarily need to go and like, let's say reinvent the wheel, right? Yeah. And I, yeah, where, where else do you think they're hanging out? Apart from these ponds, do you think, it's, I, I can maybe another way of putting it. How do you get to these people in these ponds? This is how I've grown every one of my companies. I tell people this all the time. And for some reason, nobody ever listens to me. But this is the secret. So if you really want to know what it is, um, I call this Dream 100. I learned from Chet Holmes. And what the Dream 100 is basically, I, instead of me focusing on like, who are, how do I get access to all these customers? Like that's traditional, like going and buying Facebook ads. Like I'm gonna go and I'm gonna target these people, which is great. And we do that. But what's more powerful is instead I build this Dream 100 list. So this is what I do. I call it Dream 100. And the question is, who are the hundred people, the hundred, hundred congregations of people that already have my dream customers congregated together, right? And the so first thing I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll do podcasts, right? So I go to podcasts and what I'll do is open my, grab my phone, I'll open up podcast directory. So you go to Apple, Apple uh, Podcasts and here's like news, noteworthy top shows. But if you come down here, you scroll to the very bottom and there's things that's top charts. You mm -hmm. click top charts and then it gives you categories. Um, so this is top shows, but if I want to go categories, I click on there and there it is. So let's say I, I want to be in the business market. I click on business and check it out. There are the top 200 podcasts in the business category, which means there are 200 people. Yeah, because people listening go, 100 people, how am I going to find 100? There yeah, you go, straight away. 200, yeah. 200 so then I go right down, I write down all of the 100 podcast yeah. names, or 200 podcast names, and there you are. Yeah. And then I go to Instagram, right? And I'm going to go, hey, who, who are the influencers who already congregated my people together? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to find this person. I start finding a list of as many different people there you have it. And then I go to YouTube, same thing, boom, 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 boom. And I go find different people's email lists. And so I do some research ahead of time. And eventually what happens, like it all, I, I, I always say Dream 100, for me it ends up being like three or 400 sometimes, you know? And so like when I launched my very first book, this was step number one, I sat down, okay, who could sell my book? Right, who's already congregated these people together. So I did the same thing I'm talking about here. So I found all the people and then what I did is I sent a free copy of my book to all 400 people that I found, right? And so they and get each person here. So this person owns, uh, has a podcast with a whole bunch of my dream customers. This person has a YouTube channel with my dream customers. This person, right? So instead of targeting the customer, I targeted the owner mm -hmm. of this community, mm -hmm. right? So I sent them all these books. I sent out 400 copies of the books and said, hey, here's my book. If you like it, let me know. I'd love to do something. I sent them all out. And um, again, sent out to 200 podcast people. I remember one day, like two weeks later, one guy messaged me back. He was like number 12 on my list. And his name is John Lee Dumas. He owns a podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire. He's like, hey, Russell, read your book. This is amazing. Do you want to be on the podcast? And I was like, I would love to be on the podcast. Puts me on the podcast. Suddenly I'm in front of you know, a million listeners. Does a podcast. We talk about the book. We sell the book. And then he likes so much. He has an email list. Also, he happened to have email list. He then sends like, four emails with us, buy Russell's book, buy Russell's book, buy Russell's book. Amazing. And that one person right there, he sold 1,500 copies of my book like that. And that was one person. 
right? Next day, another guy on the podcast messaged me, hey dude, you wanna be on my podcast? Sure, go to and talk to his community. And then someone on YouTube's like, hey, let's do a collab video, we'll do an interview together. Sweet, and I do YouTube. And they do this whole thing, eventually sell hundreds of thousands of copies of my book, and there's really easy. So then we launched ClickFunnels. How do we launch ClickFunnels? Sat down, build a dream on how to list. Who are the people that already have my dream customers congregated? Build a list, message them all out, and we built a billion dollar brand off the back of just doing that. All right, anything else we need to know about um, where customers hang out? Anything you think we should, we should um, make sure people... That's the core thing, and then uh, the last thing I would add is, is that when you start finding these congregations, there's two ways to get access to them. One, uh, one is to build a relationship. Uh, and that's the best, because then if they're promoting you to their audience, like it's gonna be the best. But a lot of times, you can't. Like for example, when I first met Tony Robbins, of course, he's like number one on my Dream 100, like mm -hmm. it's Tony Robbins, come on. Yeah. And so I like started reaching out to him, and, um, and it took me actually, so I, I got to know Tony Robbins, I met him about, man, about 15 years ago now. I built that relationship for about 12 years, and um, over 12 years, I never asked him for anything, I did what your shirt said, I was just, I gave without taking, I was just like, this is Tony, how can I serve him? I was helping him, I was like, his staff was calling me, I was like consulting for free, just whatever I could do to serve him, right? And 12 years into it, it's when uh, I launched my second book, Expert Secrets. And I remember Tony was speaking at my event and I was so scared, I had the book, I was so scared to give it to him and then they, the event was done, he's about to leave, the, jump on the plane or whatever. And I was like, can I give you something real quick? He's like, yeah, what's that? I'm like, I wrote this book and uh, I want you to read it. So he's like, okay, so he took on the plane and he read it and then afterwards he messaged me back, he's like, book was great, um, I'd love to promote it. And I was like, Wow. What? And so we ended up doing a Facebook Live to his audience and uh, it got like four or five million views and we sold a ton of books. But what's interesting, this is, this is the lesson for you guys, it took me 12 years to get Tony to say yes, right? And you may think that's like, I don't have 12 years to invest in this. So what's cool about Facebook and Instagram and YouTube is during those 12 years as I was, as I was building a relationship with Tony, they give you the ability to show ads to those people. So I said, I know that P Tony's people would want my book anyway. So I told Facebook and Instagram, I'm like, this is my dream 100, I want to get that person someday. I don't yet, so I'm gonna pay for ads and I would buy ads and just show it to Tony's audience. And all of a sudden Tony's people are seeing my ads all over the place because I know he's my dream 100. Yeah. He's already congregated my people, so I'm gonna buy ads on his, yeah. on his Facebook following, on his YouTube channel, right? So the dream 100, there's, again, there's two ways, right? Um, whenever I draw this, I always show like, um, there's a dream 100, right? So we have the, these lists, right? The first way, the best way is to work your way in. So if I can work my way in, that's the best, right? But it takes time and effort and energy and I gotta build a relationship. And the second way is to buy your way in. That's what that says, buy your way in, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing both at the same time. Like this is not as good, but I can pay to get access to the follow to the following, mm -hmm. right? Which is what paid ads are about and what all those kind of things we talk about a lot. And at the same time, I'm working my way in. And if I can work my way in, this is always better because then you're gonna per you get a personal endorsement from the person and they'll, they'll be recommending to audiences can convert higher, like everything's better there, mm -hmm. but I can still get access to them immediately because these platforms allow you to do that, which is crazy. It's saying, hey, I wanna show this ad to everyone that follows Tony or Simon or whatever. You, know, like, you can just target those people and start showing the, their audiences your ads prior to you ever having it done. One of my friends, Tellman, I met him, man, 15 years ago now, and he actually did, he didn't call this, but he did something similar. I remember he called me one day and he was like, hey, will you promote my thing I was doing? I, I remember I was like, no, it didn't make sense for me. And he's like, no worries, and he hung up. And then um, probably three months later, um, all of a sudden I started, in my e in email inbox, I saw like 30 people I know all emailed for his, his thing. <laughs> like, they're all showing up, and I was like, interesting. So I called him back, I was like, I was like, how did you convince all these, and he was a nobody, he had no name at the time, like, how did you convince all these people who are big names to, um, to promote you? And he's like, oh dude, it's really fascinating. He's like, um, he's like, I actually messaged, it was like, I think there was like 60 something people that told me no, 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 no. He's like, all 60 people told me no. And he's like, one person, my 63rd person said yes. And then I called the 64th person, I was like, hey, I'm doing this deal, so-and-so said yes, would you wanna be in? He's like, the next person said yes, and the next person said yes, the next 20 people all said yes. But he had to go through 60, like 63 no's to get one yes, and then he leveraged that yes to the next person, like, oh, so so-and-so and so-and-so's -and -so in, do you wanna be in too? Cool, yeah. and so-and-so, 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 so-and-so's -so in, do you wanna be in, and then everybody else said yes. And so social proof behind it as well. Now, like Russell just mentioned, having resilience when faced with rejection and struggles in business is all part of an entrepreneur's journey. If he hadn't kept pushing through all of those no's, he wouldn't have got the yes that he had been been waiting for. Many of you watching this video will go through similar experiences. And so it's important to understand that rejection and failure is all part of the process when starting a business. And it's how you tackle these challenges which really defines 
who you are as an entrepreneur. I myself have invested in 78 companies in my career, many of which have failed. I have lost lots of money and time doing so. And those failures were painful, but along the way I learned so much from these failures. Failure isn't just about the journey of making or losing money. It's about the friendships you make along the way. When you stand by people that fail, they will forever be grateful. And so failure has been nothing but a benefit to me and has helped me grow my businesses from lessons that I've learned. I have collaborated with PayPal to help enable busy entrepreneurs like yourself to have the confidence to keep pushing when times get hard and succeed. PayPal helps make life as a busy entrepreneur a little easier by simplifying your online payments. PayPal could help take the stress out of selling through streamlining your online payments platform into one single integration. This could save you time and money, which is super valuable when you're running a small business. PayPal also offers online payment methods your customers love with one secure solution. This means customers have the flexibility to pay however they want, which could help result in fewer abandoned carts and help ensure successful transactions. So what are you waiting for? Go fail and explore how your business can benefit from using PayPal today and eventually thrive. Hook bait. Okay, what do we need to know? Okay, so for me, again, I look at these, these congregations, right? So I'm gonna draw a big picture of a pond and I have all of these dream customers inside of it, right? So these are the people that are my end customers that I want to get. If you got a pond of fish, your dream customers all hanging out together, how, how would you get them, right? Well, I stand over here and with a smile, I would throw out some bait in there and try to try to capture them, right? And so bait is like how we're getting these people now, right? Because again, we're not creating traffic. Traffic's already there. They're already listening to this podcast. They're already watching the YouTube video. They're already on social, Instagram. Like, we're already spots, right? So my job is I gotta, I gotta grab their attention. And you think about this, like most people are on the phone and they're sitting there, they're scrolling, yep. they're on the couch, they're sleeping, they're in the bathroom, like they're scrolling, right? And they're looking at 100, 1,000, 10,000 things a day just scrolling. So our job is the hook, right? The hook is the thing that grabs their attention. So it stops them like, whoa, what is this? What is this thing? We gotta throw a hook out there to be able to get them. And so we're throwing out hooks all the time, right? Hooks could be, it could be a piece of content that's free, it could be an ad, it could be whatever, but we're creating something to grab their attention. Because right now they're in the, they're in the spot, they're, ha they're, they're in the community, they're doing their thing, they're there to learn or to grow or to con connect with people. So it's like, how do you create something that grabs their attention, right? And so back in the day when we were doing the wrestling stuff with themat.com, the only way we could get hooks is they sold banner ads on the side. So everyone who was trying to compete for the wrestlers, like the shoe company had banner ads there. And then the, the, the VHS tapes, the training, how to you're become a wrestler. You're showing your age now, you're yeah. showing your age. <laughs> all those were there, they're all hooks that are grab people's attention, right? For me now, it's like, okay, if I'm gonna be targeting Tony Robbins audiences, like what's the hook I'm gonna throw that's gonna grab their attention, right? Because they're just scrolling all day long. They're seeing 10,000 other people like me all competing. What's the thing I have that's gonna grab their attention, right? So that's, that's where we start. And the hook is something, so if you look at um, my core framework, I teach all three of my books. Um, it goes like this, goes hook. And from hook we move to story. And from story we move to offer. Okay, so offer is the thing that we are, that we're trading something, right? Sometimes it's the offer's money, I'm gonna give you, the, uh, I'm gonna give you money in exchange for, for information, or for a product or whatever. Sometimes the offer could be like, give me, uh, give me your email address in exchange for information. Sometimes it's just the offer's, click on this link, I'm gonna show you something cool over here. So the offer could be as simple as just clicking. And typically here, that's what the offer is, is, is a click. The hook is how we stop somebody's scroll. And when the only goal of the hook is to stop it just long enough that we can tell someone a story and then the goal of the story is to increase the perceived value of the offer we're trying to make, right? So for example, um, when I launched the Expert Secrets book, I had a thousand ads we'd run, tons of them, right? The one that was probably the best was me holding my book and uh, we had dumped gasoline all over it. This is not smart, by the way, don't do this. Because gasoline drips down and it's come down my arm and we light the book on fire. A little warning, this is not an idea for you <laughs> yeah, to try. This, this is, is not, not an idea for you to try. Yeah, but you actually professional. Did this, you we actually did this, yeah. Oh. So it was dark outside and my book was on fire and there's flames. I'm like, ah, and I, I'm holding while gas is dripping down my arm. I'm hoping it doesn't catch on fire. I'm like, I'm like my book is literally on fire. So like, I'm doing that, right? And so someone's scrolling and also they see like me with the book on fire and like, yeah. I'm kind of freaking out. It's like, that's gonna stop you, right? Yeah, yeah. So it stops, like, ah, oh, the hook is like, my book's literally on fire. So I stop the scroll, and then they're like, what is this thing? Click the, they click the sound, right? It comes on now, now I have a chance to tell them a story. And the only goal of the story is to increase the perceived value of the offer. So the offer I'm trying to get is to get them to click on a link to go buy a copy of my book. So I'm like, hey, uh, thanks so much for stopping. Like, this is my brand new book, it's literally on fire. If you go to Amazon right now, it's $20 to get it, but I wanna give you a free copy, there's my offer. I'm gonna give you a free copy. If you click the link down below, uh, all you do is you cover the shipping handling, we'll ship one out to you, and it's gonna be amazing. I'm like, and this book's awesome, like go get a free copy, click down below. All right, so hook, tell them a real quick story, it's not long, just, just enough to increase the value of the offer, which the offer is the click. Click on this thing and you're gonna get, you know, it's $20 on Amazon, you get it for free if you come to my funnel, click over here, and boom, now we got them. All right, and that video was seen, you know, 
probably 10 million times, sold, I don't know, 20, 30,000 copies of the book, right? Of idea generation when it comes to things like Hook, is, that, mm -hmm. is there a formula you follow for that? 100%, so what I do, it comes back to Dream 100, like I'm studying those people, because not only are they, my, they have my dream customers, they're speaking to my customers, they're selling things to my customers, and so my favorite thing, um, Facebook, a couple years ago got in trouble from the government and so they had to change things, so Facebook will show you every single ad that somebody is running, so what I do is like, for you for example, I would go to your Facebook page, and go to your, uh, your page you're running ads from, and there's a, you have to click, they move it every once in a while, you have to click around, but you're looking for, um, for the, the uh, tab that shows like transparency, and then ad creative, and then you click, you know, you click three or four clicks deep and boom it pops open here's every ad that you are currently running mm -hmm. and so I can look at all of them which is really cool especially mm -hmm. if you're launching book right now and I'm launching book like what is he what are the ads he's using so I find um, I'm looking at all the dream 100 like what are they doing right now to sell to my customers because mm -hmm. I'm competing against them so what are the hooks they're using what are the things they're throwing out there and I just watch everybody's ads I'm kind of a nerd but I watch all the ads especially ones that have been that are running for a long time because if it's been running for you know, it's running for a week, you have no idea if it's working, but it's been running for a year, two years, the same ad. There's mm. probably, either they hate money and they're just burning <laughs> they it. They hate money or, and they're just running crap ads all the time. Or something amazing Research. is happening, right? Yeah. And so I'm just looking at other people's ads all the time. Like you said, it's modeling, right? Like, yeah. like in fact, the book on fire, that was not my idea. Dean Graciosi was right. burning his book. He guaranteed like, he copied from someone else. Yeah. Um, okay, landing page. I feel like this one could be a big one. The landing page is one of like, I don't know, people talk the least about it. They're always worried about all the other pieces and stuff, but the landing page is like the most important because they just came from this social experience, right? If you go to a party and let's say there's a hundred friends hanging out, right? And the guy comes in and he starts trying to sell you at the party, nice. it's just awkward, right? It's like, yeah. who's this guy? Like, get him out of here. <laughs> so you go to the party, you throw a good hook out there. It's like, oh, this is awesome. You want to come back to my house? We got some cool things happening and you're getting people to leave social and they're coming to your house. So the funnel is like, this is your house. This is, they're coming back to your house and now you have the opportunity to start talking to him, right? And so, if you look over here, um, this is, let's say, this is, let's say social, this is social media, right? Over here, and we're sending them now to, uh, to a page. Okay, now over here again, we told you the, the key is like hook, story, offer. Now, what's interesting is that this framework, hook, story, offer, is the key to everything. People pay me 100 grand a day to consult for them, and they come to my offices, they always wanna like, Russell, my funnel's not working, what's wrong? And it's always one of three things. It's either the hook, the story, or the offer every time. So there's a $100,000 consulting tip. Like, just look at every step inside your process, and if it's not working, it's always either the hook, story, or offer, okay? So landing page is the same thing, right? Over here, the offer we made is like, click on this thing, and I'm gonna give you a discount or a thing, or something, right? So that was the offer. Now they're here on the landing page, and now I'm making them another offer, right? And I have to use the same process. So there's gonna be another hook, another story, another offer. Now typically, the story on the landing page is not gonna be really, really big. It's more hook and offer, right? So the hook here is probably gonna be a little different than this, but the hook is gonna be what's the thing that I am trading you, right? It's like, hey, thanks so much for coming here. I'm gonna give you the first three chapters of what's your dream for free when you give me your email address. So the offer is I'll give you this for free when you give me this, right? It's a transaction, that's an offer is. So I have a landing page, and so I'm gonna have some kind of headline. Um, the key, the secret to headlines to make them work on a landing page is curiosity. That's the most important thing. If people come to your landing page and they think they know what they're getting or they think they know what the thing is, your ad costs will go up dramatically and your opt-in rates will go down. When they show up and they're not quite sure what's happening, but they're curious, that's the big secret. Like the more curiosity you can have in a page, the better. So that comes down to this hook, right? Like, like you just clicked on the thing for the, you know, my book on fire coming here. I'm trying to create curiosity. And then I'm gonna tell you a story. And again, the story is usually gonna be very, very short form because I'm just trying to get their contact information. I don't need a long story to get that. But the story could be like, I wrote this book, I've been traveling, I've been talking to people on the street, asking what their dreams are. I wrote this really cool book and the first three chapters you get for free when you give me your email address. Mm -hmm. Boom, so very short story. And it could, be, it could be a video here or it could be just written out in text and then you ask for their contact information, right, the email address. And so that's the gold landing page. And so I think about this when I'm looking at a funnel, right? So like, if you look at a funnel, this is the direction of a funnel, right? So it's, this is the top of the funnel, it, it, dry, it, gets, it gets smaller, right? So you have, you know, the world's what, eight billion people? And then there's like Probably more six video, billion, yeah. There's like six billion on, on Facebook, or whatever, or YouTube. And then from there, there's 100,000 to watch your video. From there, there's 10,000 that are click, and they show up here, right? So let's say, let's say there's 10,000 people that see your ad or see your content, whatever, and uh, they click on it. So then over here, um, yeah, 10,000 people land on this landing page. And then the goal is to figure out, um, of the 10,000 people here, how many, how many of those 10,000 people want what you have enough that they're willing to trade you information in exchange for email, email address? 
right? Because I don't need all these, these people aren't gonna buy. If they're not willing to give me their email address in exchange for information, they're not gonna give me their credit card in exchange for information, right? So I'm qualifying people right now. So I'm saying here's all the people who, are, who saw my ad, and I'm gonna qualify these people who are willing to trade information in exchange for uh, email address, and that's kind of the goal of the landing page is to qualify them. And then again, the framework's the same. We can hook, story, offer, and that's how we make the landing page Landing page I work. think a lot of people that I see make the mistake of trying to get money off people straight away, mm -hmm. and that and that is even more scary for people. At least if you've got their email address and you can then connect with them and make a relationship with them outside of this funnel yeah. into another funnel, but like that that way people don't feel yeah people are too greedy too quick. And you think about like what we're actually doing here. Remember step one we talked about finding your dream customer. Like we're just curious. We're making our own congregation of our dream customers, right? Now we have an email list of 10 people, 100 people, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, whatever, of your dream customers. Now you have your own congregation. Mm -hmm. And what's powerful about this is like, then when you or you're, you know, whoever's listening to this, when you write a book and you want to launch it, or when you have a new offer comes out, or you have something, I don't have to go buy ads or go do, I, I log in, write an email, click send, it goes out to 100,000 people, mm -hmm. and traffic instantly shows up. Mm -hmm. One too many, I'm really excited about hearing about this. This is one of the secrets. So having a funnel is great. But the only real goal of a funnel is, is for you to be able to make a presentation to them eventually, right? To sell them something. And what's interesting is you look at traditional business, most sell happens one-on-one, -on -one, right? Face-to-face, -face, on the phones, it's very much like that. Now, for me, when I got into business, I'm an extreme introvert. I get scared talking, especially selling on one-to-one, face-to-face, -face, like I really struggle, could not do. So for me, when I was I started, I was like, I have to figure out how to sell differently, right? And so the, the way I learned it initially is I would, I would go to seminars, I'd watch people step on stage, they would make a presentation for 90 minutes and then they would sell something at the end, right? And I started watching people do this and it was like, have you, I'm sure you've seen it before, right? Yeah, and people run the back of the room, they buy stuff. And I remember seeing that and, uh, and I was like, this is, this is amazing, I have to learn the skill set. Like, I remember the very first event I went to, I had no idea, I'd never seen events before like this. I sat down and I'm there on my laptop taking notes and the first guy's speaking about something, he does his presentation and then he, makes, he offers a $2,000 course. And I remember watching the room, people jumping up and running to the back of them with their credit cards. And, and I was like, what just happened? I started doing the math, I'm like, it's $2,000 offer. I was doing the math in the back of them, two, four, six, and I was like, he made $60,000 in an hour and a half. That's Next great. guy gets up on stage, he does his presentation, he's selling the $5,000 offer. And I'm watching this and people start running to the back for $5,000. I was like, Five thousand and people running back with the car and I do the math. Some of them are actors though, can't they? Sometimes they, Maybe, now I, I see don't. people doing it as actors. Like, I'm paying you to run to the back and scream, I'm doing this. You know? People excited. It's a bit herd mentality a little bit, right? But I remember doing the math now and that guy made over hundred grand. I was like, Man. okay, I have to learn this. And I remember, um, so again, this is almost 20 years ago and I have funny footage of me trying this. I went to my very first event to speak and I got on stage, I had this tie on, I was trying to be all very businessy and, and I tried to, I was trying to sell, it was so awkward. I tried to make the pitch, nobody bought, like not a single person. I was so embarrassed. And I remember I was like, I'll never do this again. I'm too introverted. This is like so painful. But I kept going to events and seeing people do that. Like, I'm like, this is a learnable skill. Other people can do this. Sales thing. is a learnable I've skill. I've got to figure People're this out, yeah. It, yeah. But I realized that selling one-on-one -on -one versus one-on-many is different, right? Because if I'm speaking to 100 people or 1,000 people or on a funnel, it could be millions of people, right? I don't know, I can't talk to each person and resolve their concerns. So I have to learn how to tell stories in a way that will convince a lot of people wants to buy something, right? And so I spent the next, honestly, decade of my life learning this. I went to, I went, I studied from some people really good. I went, started going to every event. I would just take notes on the speakers and what they were doing and how they were doing it. And I got better and better. Just kind of a, to wrap the story, uh, four years ago I spoke at an event and the, the record, the world record at the time for most back of the rooms uh, sold in a 90 minute presentation was like $1.4 million. And, uh, and so I, I had a goal. I was speaking at a Grant Cardone's event. There's 9,000 people. I was like doing the math as like, hey, if I did this, and so we had this whole goal, and we went and um, I did my 90 minute presentation, and we closed 3.2 million dollars nice. in sales. And that I would is be, amazing. I would be like the most awkward to setting the setting the record. That is yet. amazing. And what do you think? I mean, again, I, what I love about this story is that people listening are introverts. Yeah. A lot of people who are introverts think they can't sell. Yeah. So you can. This is definitely a learned sales. Is definitely a learned skill, and you can use your personality to sell, right? Yeah. So actually, you being an introvert and selling is kind of a superpower. Yeah. Because there's not that many introverts selling, right? So. Yeah. But what do you think the main learnings were in that process? So the biggest thing I many? learned is. Like when I'm speaking one to many, I'm not trying to sell people things. What I'm trying to figure out is like, what's the belief that they have that would keep them from buying what I'm trying to sell? Mm. Like that's the real question, right? What's mm. the belief they have? And why do they have that belief? Like something happened in their life that gave them that belief. And so they're telling themselves a story. Like this is the story I have why this, why this would never work for me, right? Like it could be business. Like, well, I like watching business stuff, but it never worked for me because I tried a business in the past and it failed. Or my dad was a business owner. He failed, lost all his money. So it's not gonna work for me. So I have this belief. And so they have this story that, that the, the belief created this story, right? That goes in their minds. So every time they get introduced with an opportunity to do something, like, oh, the story subconsciously pops up. Oh, I would, but I have this story that I can't do because of that reason. 
So my job when I'm doing a presentation is I'm trying to figure out what's the false belief they have and what's the story they're telling. What story do I have that will trump their story? If I have a story that's better than their story, it will rewrite their story. And so when I do a one of my sales presentation, like that's the whole, the goal is like, what are the false beliefs they have that keep them from moving forward with you? And you gotta tell, tell them stories. Mm -hmm. And so you look at this, like, I look at any good funnel, right? They're coming here, they're coming to a landing page. I get their contact information like we talked about, right? And then from here, it's always eventually gonna send them some type of presentation. Now this could be uh, what we call video sales letter, or they call it the VSL, right? So it could be a VSL, which is basically, now there's a video of me, it could be a 20 minute video of me, telling some stories about this right. thing, breaking the false beliefs, and then at the end I make an offer. So if you look at this, again, there's gonna be a hook <laughs> to watch the video, there's gonna be a story, which is the stories I'm telling inside the video to break the false beliefs, and then make an offer, hook story offer. Could be via sale. Sometimes they register, and, or they give me their info, and they're registering for a webinar, right? And I love webinars, this is how I built our entire ClickFunnels business was by doing a webinar, right? And all the webinar is is one to many sales presentation, right? I have 90 minutes with them. So um, sometimes I do uh, I get people to register, and then the one to many presentation is a challenge that I run over five days. Right? Everything in the funnel is leading eventually to a kind of presentation where I'm gonna tell them a story to break their false beliefs and then make them an offer to buy something. This is the first time in the, in the funnel where actually the offer isn't just, here we're trading their email address for information, here we're trading money for information for a product or whatever that thing might be, right? And it happens here. Okay, yes! All right, what do we need to know about this? All right, this is the first time we get them to buy something. This is where we make the offer, right? So this is happening during the one-to-many presentation. Again, we've gone through and we made the presentation, and the last thing we do, again, we talk about this again, we got hook, story, offer. And so the hooks get them on, gets them there, right? The story is the webinar, and then the offer, this is the piece that uh, a lot of people mess up. So the offer, there's two ways to have the cheapest product in town, right? One way is you have something and um, if you wanna be the cheapest person in town, you try to lower the price, right? And so in commodity-based businesses, you see this all the time, right? You go to the store and you'll see a shirt, right? And the shirt's on the rack and let's say it's 100 bucks. But any store can sell a shirt, so like the next guy's like, well I can sell it for 90 bucks, I'll sell it for 80, I'll sell it for, and so like, it's this race to the bottom, right? And the guy who sells it for $20, he gets all the customers, but there's no margin and that's how they lose, but they have the cheapest, price in town, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how most people do it. My first mentor is Dan Kennedy. He told me one time, it's so powerful, he said, he said, um, there's no strategic advantage of being the second lowest price leader in town. Like if you're Walmart, you're the lowest price, there's a strategic advantage there. But if you're second lowest price, there's no strategic advantage of being the second lowest price. But he's like, there's a huge strategic advantage of being the most expensive. So what I try to do is like, how do I make my product seem cheap, not by lowering the price, but increasing the value, right? And so getting them to say the first yes is all about making an irresistible offer that's, that's really, really good. So whenever I'm building a presentation or making an offer or whatever, I always start with, the, I call it the stack slide. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna stack like all the value. So I'm gonna, the first thing you buy from me is you're gonna get this thing, right? This could be a course, or it could be a product, or it could be whatever, right? There's the first thing. And the second thing you're gonna get is this. And the third thing you get is this. And I, I add all these things to increase the, the value of the thing to where it seems inexpensive, right? Because all money, all, all transaction is, if someone's looking at it, they have a $10 bill, and you've got something, and they're saying, that thing you have is worth more than $10 to me, therefore I'll give you $10. And you're saying the thing I have is worth less than $10, therefore I, you know, that's how the, the transaction happens, right? So I gotta create something that increases the value, and so I create a, a really cool offer that someone's gonna buy. Now, my favorite story of this, I was speaking at, um, I was speaking at Garrett White's event, and he wanted me to speak about offers to people, help his, his audience understand offers. And I had just bought, in fact, this phone, I need to get a new one, smash now, but I just bought this phone. And I remember I got on stage, and I was trying to give a, a case study, I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this out. So I pulled this phone, and I said, I bought this, this new phone at Best Buy last week for $800. Who here would give me $800 for this phone? And like, there's one Russell fan in the back, like, I'll give you $100, <laughs> but nobody else, right? And I was like, how many of you guys would give me $500? You know, a couple hands up, how about 300? 200, by $100, like most times, I'll give you $100 for the phone, like I can sell it to my kid or whatever, right? Um, I said, okay, now I'm gonna show you this magic trick. The exact same phone, I'm gonna make it worth a lot more money. I said, okay, well you guys know about this phone, this is my personal phone, and I just bought it last week, and I transferred all my things over here. The first thing I transferred is all the courses. I said, I am the biggest course junkie in the world. I've bought every, every course, every coaching program in business, marketing, personal development, sales, known demand. Like you name it, I have it, I've invested in it, um, I pay ticket price, I buy the event, and then I get the courses and recordings. Uh, my accountant showed me uh, the numbers, and I said, uh, over the last three years, I spent, it's like $485,000 in courses. And since I get the course, first thing I do, my brother takes them and he rips them into audio, and I put them on my phone. So I have 
almost half a million dollars of courses on this phone, they're all on here. Number two is um, my personal Rolodex. So I've got Tony Robbins cell phone on here, I've got so-and-so, Serious I've got data so -and -so. breach if you did actually sell your phone at this point. <laughs> like, I've, got, yeah. I've got all these phone numbers here. So like, they, like my network, I've spoken, yeah. spent the last 20 years building, can't, they're can't all on here. put a price on this now. And I go next and I start going through all these things on my phone. And I said, I want to open the auction. Who here, who here to give me 10 grand for my phone? Every hand went up. I'm like, yeah. who give me 15 grand? 20 grand. I was like, you guys gotta be serious because someone here is gonna buy this phone today. So don't raise your hand that you're willing to come and give money. I'm like, 40 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand, 200 grand. Got all the way up to $500,000. There's still three people's wow. hands raised. I said, you guys come up here. Like, you gotta be willing. When you guys gonna write me a check for half a million, Dave, you gotta come up here. You're serious. So like, three guys come on stage. I was like, 15 minutes ago, you wouldn't give me 100 bucks for this. Why would you give me $500,000 right now? I had the guy on the mic and he said, he's like, honestly, after you told me everything is involved in there, it seems really inexpensive. Yeah. I think like, that's the magic, right? Yeah. You create an offer that's so good that someone looks, man, I'd be, I'd be In more fairness, on it iPhone that. do that with their, you know, their app store access and music and making everything easy to sync. Yeah. They're not just selling a hardware product. That's why people don't understand. They think their Samsung phone's better. Why does that sell so well? They're offering value, aren't they? Yeah. Extra value. All the other stuff. We, we did something very, I, did, I, had a, I have hoodies we were selling and I gave a hoodie to a young guy who wanted to start a, his own fashion brand. I said, well, here's a hoodie. I'll put your video up and you want to start your own brand and we'll put it up online. And if anyone buys your hoodie, I'll go for lunch with them as well well and record their dream. Mm -hmm. And so bidding in the comments started happening. The $65 to buy it, right? $100, $200, yeah. $500, $1,000. And basically we actually stopped it at 1,000. I'm like, 1,000 for a hoodie. And we sold three for him. And he got $3,000 <laughs> for a hoodie, basically. Uh -huh. You just add value. People, don't, yep. people are so willing to bring price down and they don't use their brain power to add value. Yep. And that's like a, another secret source yep. to it. What can you add value-wise so that people will be willing to pay a little bit more for your product? Yeah, so this is fun for me actually. Have you ever read the book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? No. No? Oh, okay. Well, this is your homework assignment. So oh, there's this right. book about this mouse and you give the mouse a cookie, but after he eats a cookie, he's like, oh, I'm thirsty now, I need a glass of milk. So he gives him a glass of milk. And then he gives a glass of milk and he makes a milk mustache. He's like, ah, oh, I need to go wash my face. He goes, wash his face. And so like, it's this whole series of events that keeps happening. Because you give a mouse a cookie, you had to do like 20 other things, right? Same thing's happening when I make an offer, right? So if, like for example, when I make my offer, for people click funnels, I'm like, I'm gonna give you this funnel software, it's called click funnels, it's gonna change your life, right? So that's the first thing I offer here. So that's the cookie. They're like, sweet, I got click funnels, I have funnel software. I'm like, you don't know how to actually use it. So next thing I'm gonna give you is I'm gonna give you a course, the six week course is walking you exactly how to use it. Like, oh cool. So now I got ClickFunnels software, now I got the course, now what they need. Well, I don't know like what to say in the funnels. Like I could build a funnel, but like, you know, it's like, oh, well let me teach you copywriting. So we have a copywriting scripts and software. That now you got the copies, now you got the funnel software, you got the training, and then the copies taking care of your funnels. What else do you need? Like, oh, well, um, I don't know how to get traffic. Like, oh, well, I'm gonna give you traffic, so I'm gonna give you my course on traffic. It's so, like, I'm giving them all the things they need to get the result they actually want. Because they don't even know these are problems yet, everything else in the offer, but they're gonna, you know that, because like, you've, you've worked some, right? So I know, like, I'm gonna give you this, and then that'll solve one problem, but it'll create a new problem. So what's the next thing you need? Okay, you give you this, it'll solve that problem, but then it creates a new one, and you do everything in the offer until it's like, Okay, now you have a complete solution. Now if you have this alone, you can go be successful with it. And that's how you create an irresistible offer that, that people are like, I have to give you money for this. This makes, like, it makes no logical sense not to. Last but not least. <laughs> second, second yes. yes. Oh, it's okay. There's no second no, there's only a second. <laughs> this is really the magic in funnels. So the hardest thing to get people to buy is the first thing, right? Because I had to convince you that this is like, Again, if someone's come to my world and they want to buy ClickFunnels, I had to convince you that you want to start a funnel software, or you, or you want to use, use funnels in your business, you're gonna need the software, you're like, I have to admit, that's a heavy lift to get them to say the first yes. After they've already said the first yes, now they're like, they're committed to that, every yes afterwards is infinitely easier to say, mm -hmm. right? So for example, like in my, my book funnel, so I know you're gonna be launching a book soon, we should talk about book funnels eventually for you, but I have a book funnel, right? For all my books, and I drive people to it, and the first thing I'm selling is a book, and I sell my books, they're free, you just cover like $10 shipping and handling, right? And you think like, oh, that's an irresistible offer, should be easy. That's the hardest thing I sell in the funnel, because I had to have a long form sales letter, here's the bullet points you're gonna get, here's the testimonials, here's like, I work so hard to sell this $10 thing, right? They pay $10 shipping handling for the book, then the next page is like, they've already committed now, like I bought expert secrets, I wanna become an expert. I bought traffic secrets, I'm gonna learn traffic. The next yes is really simple. It's just like, cool, so you decided you wanna get traffic, you know, for $297, there's other thing you can get as well. And usually my, my video to sell this is like two minutes long max, I'm selling a $297 offer, and they just say yes. Like 30% of people just click yes, boom, yes, super easy. We have a $10,000 coaching program we sell, and this is hard, it takes me, I have a three day challenge event I go through to get people to buy that. Next page over here is, uh, there's a video, it's like a two minute video for me. 
a two minute video saying, Kill, you just invested $10,000. I actually have a $25,000 coaching program. You've already invested 10. If you want, I'll apply that 10 towards the $25,000 and you can upgrade to $25,000. They've already, they're already that far. Right now, it's like 46% of people say yes to the wow, $25,000 offer. Wow, that's amazing. Right? Um, this is true anything. If I have a $1,000 offer, right now we have a $1,000 offer we sell. Um, from the $1,000 offer, uh, this is teaching people how to build funnels for themselves. We have a certification program for 5K. The next page, we say, hey, by the way, you're learning this, would you like to be certified that we can do this as a career for other people? I'm like, sure, and like 30% of people click yes for a $5,000 upgrade. So the second yes is so much easier, and most people skip that. This is where the profit side of a business is made. I'm very much heavy on, we pay for ads to get traffic. Organic, you have all sorts of profit, right? But if I'm paying for ads, usually this first thing I'm selling is just covering the ad costs. Mm -hmm. And then this is where all the profit comes from, is the thing on the back end. And so having the second thing, um, one of my mentors wrote a book in there, talks about, his name's Mark Joyner, but in his book he talks about like, um, you sell a customer a glass of water and then this, then you sell them a second glass. Like second glass is so much easier because they already take a drink, ah, yeah, I like this, I want some more, right? And that's what a lot of people are forgetting. That's what funnels are so powerful because getting them to say the second yes or the third yes or things like that is so much simpler because you've done the hard work, build the relationship, you did the, break the false beliefs, they invested in something and then you say, hey, do you want to upgrade? Yeah, might as well. Mm -hmm. You think about the airlines, right? 30% of every airline, people spend five times as much money for the first class seats that are a little bit bigger because mm -hmm. it's like, ah, oh, I'm an upgrade, sure, might as well. I always think airlines miss a trick when you're standing at the counter and they don't offer you the upgrades anymore, even though they've got the seats spare because I walk, you see it. You know, oh, they don't, 100%, they don't, yeah. You're in business class, you're probably a little bit extra, you upgrade to first class, why yeah. not have the experience? But yeah. The second sale is missed by a lot of people. Um, I think I've missed it at points in my life, for sure. We just did a, just for fun, we launched a sweet brand called Busy's. It was about $10 for the sweets. And we were just, just testing. We put it out, 1,300 people bought it. We're like, okay, they bought sweets, they bought the sweets. But the thing that was really amazing is that we got everyone's email address and we emailed them saying, thank you for buying the sweets. They actually replied back saying, one, we'd love to buy more sweets. Mm -hmm. Easiest sell in the world, a second back. The thing is, what else you got going on? You know, love to, love your product, anything else going on? People, are, the second sale was actually even easier than you think because people even want you to yeah. come to them with something. My friends are annoyed, like, is this all you got? Like, what else do I have? Yeah, exactly, yeah, the upgrade thing is really powerful. I'm actually though shocked 10 to 25, 46%, but you've done a very good job in the qualifying yeah. round piece, right? So you yeah. target it properly. Your, your messaging is very clear because yeah, I think that's, uh, but that's, there must be a third, third yes. Oh, there's always more. Yes. <laughs> Fourth yes. We could just keep going yeah. forever on this video. Well, it's funny. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you know Ryan Dice, but me and Ryan Dice were in a mastermind group together. Dan Kenny's mastermind. This is back man, 15 years ago. And I remember we were, we were like the young guys at the time, we we're like 21, 22 years old. We're in this group with all these like big business people. We're so excited. And I remember we were in, in the Bahamas at this event with these guys and Ryan came to me, we're talking. He's like, he's like, so did you buy J Bram stuff? I bought everything. He's like, me too. And then he's like, who did you buy this guy? And we're going to all the gurus. Like, yeah, we bought that, we bought, we bought everything. And he's like, why are you here at Dan's thing? I was like, I don't know. And he's like, Dan's the only one that kept selling me stuff. That's why I'm here. Oh. Everyone else stopped. Right. And one of my big beliefs is that a buyer will continue to buy from you until one or two things happen. Either number one, you offend them, or number two, you stop selling something. Mm. And so yes, there's always an offer after the offer after the offer. Like, it's crazy for me, like I've got, again, we have our $10,000 mastermind, we have 25,000, we have a 50,000, and then I remember a couple years ago, I was like, I wonder if anyone would pay me 150,000. So I launched a $150,000 mastermind, sold out in an hour. And I was like, I wonder if we're gonna pay 250. So next year we launched a $250,000 mastermind, sold out in an hour. So I was like, I don't know what the limit is. Yeah. Right now I've stopped the thing, there, but, but the, there's always The pricing more. is another thing. I, I was like, I, I built a creative agency and the first person I worked with was a creative. She was designing a brand. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how much for that? She's like, 5,000 US dollars. I'm like, no, that's 50. And I thought, she's like, no way. They're never gonna pay 50 for me to design a logo. I'm like, let me try. We got 50 for yeah. it. But I realized it's worth a million. Yeah. I limited myself, even in that moment. I thought she was limiting herself. I'm like, no, are you undercharging? I'm gonna charge properly for it. Later I found out what the big companies yeah. charge. I'm like, we were undercharging at 50. <laughs> I, I was taking the piss out of her for charging five. We limit ourselves, don't we? Yeah. we? We make an assumption about what people will pay and we don't actually test it, mm -hmm. right? It blows yeah. my mind. Um, this is so valuable, and I know right now people just listen to this, there's about a million people going, oh, I've got to go sell more to my customers. I've stopped selling to them, so it's brilliant. <laughs> I want to thank you for giving your time to come here today. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience do too. I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast, and go eat some chicken along with us now. See you later.